So I'm in the coveted position in that I am the last one in our group project that gets to talk. And so what I'm going to talk about builds directly on everything that Ashley's presented and aspects of um, what Laura presented earlier. So just to kind of review um, what I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to be talking about what happens to fish um, when their forest is on fire, and I'm going to be incorporating different aspects of some of our freshwater responses in context of fish. And as Ashley and Laura um, discussed, we have 24 watersheds from the Cascades of Oregon where we're answering that question for. So again, um, kind of building on what our speakers talked about yesterday and even into this morning, there were strong winds in Western Oregon that ignited many small fires and they led to the ignition and expansion into the widespread landscape. And what you have here um, are fires across multiple ownerships. And so these Oregon Day, um, Oregon Labor Day fires of 2020 um, spread across federal lands, state lands, and private lands, offering an exceptional opportunity for us to understand um, some of the freshwater responses in this broader context. So if you look here on the left, you see um, our study design that they've both talked about, and in black is where our watersheds are selected. Um, and on right is just an example of what um, one of the burned um, sites looks like for um, Elkhorn Creek. And I want you to look at that photo for a moment and think about it from the perspective of a fish. So think about you know, what it's like to be a fish in that water. And so the different responses and aspects that I'm going to talk about are, in some cases, it's indirect responses, and in other contexts, it's direct responses influencing you know, fish habitat and fish themselves. So I want to talk a little bit about what's in the literature and what's known about, you know, the links between fish, forests, and fire. Um, we have a lot of literature out there um, on what are the links between fish and fire. A lot of our work comes from the Rocky Mountains or from the east side um, of uh, Washington, Oregon, and into Idaho, um, now down into California. Um, the, the response that's most looked at in response to freshwater responses is stream temperature, um, followed by sediments. Those are the, the big things that people look at in response to fire. And in general, what's been found is that um, generally temperatures increase in response to fire, temperatures increase in response to fire, sometimes with sediments. It depends on, based on the context in that site, um, the delay or the timing of when that sediment arrives to the stream. But what le is less understood is some of the responses directly to the biological responses. For the biological responses, macroinvertebrates are the most well studied of all of our taxa, followed by fish, followed by amphibians. So what's known about fish um, directly in response to fire has essentially been that we have mixed responses. And so what that essentially means is in some of the streams, we see our numbers of fishes go up. In some of our streams, we see the numbers go down. In some of the streams, some of the fishes are getting bigger, and in some um, cases, they're getting smaller. And it depends, and a lot of times, a lot of those indirect effects of some of the other things in the context of the, the stream themselves as to what's kind of playing out in some of those different responses. So going into the study, we wanted to make some predictions about um, the freshwater responses to fire. And so this is a study um, from Gresswell in 1988, where he essentially looked at different aspects of aquatic responses and made some hypotheses about what we might expect to see. So on the far left side, you're looking at a normal year that the different responses, what it would look like in a normal year. In the middle is that first year post fire. And so you're looking at the different seasons, and in some cases, so if you look at fishes at the bottom, the bump goes up um, in spring into summer, saying that in response to fire, we should see that increase. That was the hypothesis. And then years after fire, we should have a drop, and then again, an increase again. But there's aspects of looking at this figure and thinking about predictions and knowing what some of the other um, studies have shown that shows or that points to um, the context specific that's not included in these generalizations, as well as there isn't anything about fire severity. So it's not clear here, and it's not necessarily clear um, how fish in general respond when the fire is a low severity fire versus a high severity fire. 
So again, we looked at 24 watersheds in the Cascade Range. Um, we stratified, did a random sample design um, in the three different fire boundaries, and we studied fourth order streams, which are fishy streams, and we looked at it over a gradient of watershed stand age and a gradient of fire severity. And we re, um, measured various um, freshwater responses that include physical and chemical responses. And I'm going to dig into the biological responses. And I'll touch a little bit on the physical responses in context of the biological responses. And I do want you to note that all of the data that I'm presenting from here forward is year one data. So again, the fires were Labor Day fire of 2020, and we're measuring the following year during seasonal low flow. So we're measuring in the summer um, following. So it tends to be eight to 11 months later. Um, we have that range because, for example, our temperature measurements are you know, over um, the course of that seasonal low flow period. So looking at the link between fish, forests, and fire, um, I want to orient you to this figure that Ashley introduced you to. And I want you to notice that the y-axis um, is driven by um, watershed stand age. So those responses that you're seeing over there are most influenced by aspects of watershed stand age. And our x-axis here is most influenced by fire severity. And what you're able to see in context of fire severity is that our severe fires burn overstory vegetation. And that's related to increases in light. Um, that's related to more tree mortality, um, dissolved organic matter, and increase in macroinvertebrate densities, so higher numbers of our macroinvertebrates. So again, when we have more severe fires, then we have the declines in the canopy cover, the large wood diameter that Ashley spoke to, um, the macroinvertebrate diversity, as well as um, our fish densities. So let's dig into some of those relationships. The first one I want to look at is related to canopy cover, showing that canopy cover of the riparian forest declines with increased fire severity. So fire severity is across the bottom. And what you're looking at here is a decline at the sites that have the most um, severe fires. And in addition, at those sites, um, we also have higher mortality of trees at those burned sites. So again, fishes in our stream are in a fourth order streams. Um, these streams have coastal cutthroat trout. We have rainbow trout or steelhead. We have coho juveniles. We have Chinook juveniles. We have our speckled dace, our long-nosed dace. We have various sculpins. And we have Pacific lamprey. And even at a few sites, we had brook trout. So just to give you a sense of our fish composition that are at all of these sites, this analysis is for all of the fish put together. And so what you're looking at here is a hump-shaped pattern in that you have um, lower densities at our less um, severely burned sites with the highest um, numbers of fish densities at our mid-severe burn sites. And again, the um, le least amount of density of fishes at our highest suburban um, burn severity sites. And for our macroinvertebrate density, um, you see um, an increase with, in numbers of macroinvertebrates. The densities go up with fire severity as shown here. But again, as mentioned earlier, you see this diversity um, decline. So even though the numbers are going up, we're having a shift in the composition of which macroinvertebrates are present at the site. Um, and that's owing to a decline in the percent of scrapers at the site, while our EPT taxa um, increased at lower severity fires um, and declined at the higher severity fires. We see that our severe fires burn more overstory vegetation, and that leads to an increase in light and stream temperature. Um, as um, you're able to see here, the in, um, increase in um, light and stream temperature um, related to fire severity. So I mentioned earlier that that data I was presenting was from the first year post-fire, and we've started to work up some of the data that we've collected this last summer um, in 2022. So again, looking at Elkhorn Creek, you get a sense for what it looked like in 2021, and what you're looking at here is um, some of the response of the um, riparian environment and what it looks like in 2022. 
And so at some of our sites, um, you're seeing canopy cover is opening for some of the sites a year later. And so um, you're, again, you're looking at fire severity across the bottom and canopy cover on our Y axis. And what you're looking at here is the difference between the years. Um, and so um, 2021 is in the pink color, 2022 is in the blue. Um, and generally from you know, one year to the next, they're, they're similar for canopy cover. However, there's a variety of these sites where it's actually opening um, from one year to the next. And again, um, here for light, we're seeing an increase in light um, with fire severity a year later. So looking at that year two data versus the year one later, um, versus the year one data, we're seeing um, light increases with um, more severe fires at sites with more severe fires. And our stream temperature responses, um, we're seeing um, Temperature is consistently warmer a year later. Um, so again, um, the 2021 data is shown there in the pink and the 2022 data is shown there in the blue. And you're able to get a sense for what the temperatures um, are doing a year later. And um, it should be noted that the range for our temperatures, um, just because some other studies have shown today what their temperature ranges have been, you'll notice that our seven day max get ups to 25 degrees for our highest um, severity burn fires. We had values reaching 28 degrees at some of our streams, 26 degrees. Um, but you will see that there are sites, especially for our lower severity fires where temperature ranges um, you know, are staying a lot lower and well under 20 degrees. So fire severity definitely plays a role in the response of stream temperatures. So um, in general, our take home messages are that uh, fish, forests and fires are um, directly linked and have really strong relationships that you can see by looking at um, the responses over 24 streams. Um, severe fire, the severe fire burns more overstory vegetation leading to increases in some responses and decreases in others and that changes are happening between year one and year two after fire, and we expect to continue. We're gonna be um, continuing to measure um, into year three into this summer. And it's unclear exactly what the response of the fish will be in year two, especially because of the loss of trees from fire or from salvage, um, that that could increase the seasonal low flow leading to potentially more available habitat and a little bump in our fishes in year two, or we can continue to see the same pattern where you're, we're seeing the decrease um, at our most severe sites. Our next steps um, on this project that are underway is we're doing extractions of eDNA samples that we collected in the lab because we're hoping to understand the effects of um, forest stand age and fire severity over a broader swath of freshwater biodiversity. And with uh, the approach that we use, we can detect up to 900 different species. And so we want to get a sense for what those relations look like across these different sites. Um, so we're currently extracting those samples in the lab and hope to have some results of that coming up soon. And there are many people to thank, especially on a project like this, where you're working across ownerships on federal, state, and private lands. So I want to thank many of you here in the crowd that gave us permissions to be on your land and are partnering with us on this work. Um, thank you. And um, I would like to invite my esteemed colleague, Ashley, back up here so that we can field questions together. Yeah, the question was whether the large woody, the large wood response is potentially related to distance to a tributary as opposed to um, just um, large wood contributions from adjacent to the stream channel. And um, I mean, certainly that's possible. I think in general, we tried to be very, uh, we tried to uh, identify the starting location at um, sort of the lowermost point of that fourth order watershed um, where we are able to gain permissions on that landowner. So they should be placed 
very similarly situated in terms of, of where we're at within the stream network. Obviously, there's uh, many differences, of course, in terms of the drainage network across there. And I just, I, we can look at that, I think, but um, it, well, we do have variables like um, uh, drainage density that we can look at. I don't know that we would specifically expect a distance uh, to a tributary necessarily um, to be influencing this large wood. I think it's it's likely being influenced by a large number of factors, and so we're we're trying to use this observational approach of quantifying as many of those as we as we can. But I'm not sure if we will be able to tease that apart. So thinking about the invertebrate responses, you, you mentioned that the EPT, so stoneflies, mayflies, caddisflies, <clears throat> had declined, but the scrapers had gone up. So I'm curious what organisms you see in snails, or, or what is it? You can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Brooke presented it, yes, uh, she should be prepared. Um, I, there were plenty of snails um, in the sample. I'm not sure exactly uh, which were contributing in that. Um, I don't know that. Offhand. We haven't done the best uh, analysis yet in terms of the community composition other than those metrics, right? Okay. But we have the data, I mean, we can tell you after this. Yeah, it's been interesting to look at the differences in some of these streams in the McKenzie. Um, and David Donahue's here somewhere, he could probably back me up, but I think it was Elk Creek, was it? But it was just lousy with snails, there's so many. And it, was, it seemed to be kind of unusual, so just curious about that. So related to that, there is a poster out there that's looking at the response of Juga snails. Um, and so you can get a sense of which of our sites actually had Juga snails. And um, it's looking at um, rates of um, infection of the Juga snails. Um, so it might be worth going out and checking out the poster. You'll get a sense of which sites had the snails. Um, I've got a question. Um, since you worked on different uh, um, land ownerships with different land manage management agencies and private, um, are you tracking the difference in uh, the buffer zones for leaving wood for source for large wood into the future um, in your study? Yeah, so I think the question is whether we're tracking riparian salvage um, and whether wood is being retained in the riparian zone after salvage operations. Um, so we're trying to get at that, yes. So we did request from all landowners um, total area salvage for the entire watershed, and we also asked for any additional information we could get on any salvage that occurred within the riparian area. Um, the, w the way in which that was uh, determined varied a little bit by landowner, and so we're trying to also do some ground truth thing with, in collaboration with our veg team just to... Uh, actually measure the, the width of the buffers and make sure that it's in agreement with some of the data that we've um, extract, extracted from uh, various landowners. So we do hope to be able to look at that going forward. Um, initially, we really didn't get into it um, because it's so highly correlated with fire severity at this stage of the project, but I think the next stage of our analysis will be to more directly look at um, those categories specifically. Um, the question is why we used volume of wood versus, but I'm not sure what the alternative was that you're recommending. Architecture, location, organization, orientation, zonation. By type, I mean ramp, ramp, bridge, location, the zonation, zones one, two, three, and four, wood within the wetted perimeter of the channel, zone four is terrestrial wood outside of the bankful uh, etches, uh, zonation, uh, Orientation, the, the directionality of the piece within the main full channel, that sort of thing. Something more okay. specific. No, yeah, so we did collect zone information on zones and we did an analysis of that and we didn't see any difference in terms of zones across this gradient. Um, and, and so we, have, we do have some of that additional information and we just didn't find anything interesting in that in the first year post fire, um, which is what we've analyzed so far. And um, just to add what Ashley said, um, 
as you saw, there's a lot of data that we're collecting at all of these sites when we go out, and we're generally um, spending anywhere from one to two days at the site. And so um, there also are some decisions that we made related to what we're measuring and how we're measuring it so that we can you know, get to all these sites in the, during one season. I had a, can you guys hear me? Yeah. I had a question, um, I think it's for Ashley. It was surprising that the red alder had um, less mortality than the other species. I, to me, it seems like alders got thinner bark. It would have burned and be more easily damaged. But I'm wondering if you th what you think the mechanism is and maybe if it has something to do with kind of the microclimates where it hangs out, that it's wetter there and it maybe was more protected. I'm just curious because it was a little counterintuitive and very interesting. Yeah, so we're not, I mean, this, this has been found by others in the literature, not only for red alder, but other deciduous species. Um, yeah, I would hypothesize it's related to the evapotranspiration of red alder is still, has really high evapotranspiration rates late in summer, whereas some of the conifers may close their stomata, and so maybe more, uh, maybe drier, but uh, I'm not a vegetation expert, but that's one possible mechanism, but yes, um, we, we also, yeah, red alder was really prevalent at our sites, um, and certainly this is at the fourth order watershed scale, so um, if you look at a soil burn severity map, uh, the worst it is in the riparian area is a moderate uh, burn within 100 feet of the stream at this scale. So it's, we're not in those really high severity soil burn um, in these particular riparian areas. <laughs> 